If someone is clearly a better hinger than a squatter, and they only have five degrees of hip internal rotation, yikes, and also limited in hip external rotation, which would you attack first? I know you said you go after primary compensations first. Interventions can be less successful if they're secondary compensations. So I want to make sure I get this right from the start. These are tough ones. This, uh, I'll tell you what, like one of the toughest populations that I have is, is people who have super stiff hips. Um, first thing I would say is if you're doing interventions and you're not getting any change, I think it's really important for this population to get some imaging because if it's an older population, you might be looking at osteoarthritis. If it's a younger population, you could be looking at cam pincer impingements that are structurally bad enough that they may actually be surgical cases in order to attain depth. Um, I, I don't, you know, unfortunately, the, the research on efficacy of the surgeries to improve impingement is sparse, but if you have a structural issue, you need to do something about that. I have this one guy who I spent some time working with. He's a, he's a golfer. And he, right, when I bring him into flexion and I test IR, he doesn't have hardly any IR, but he gets to about 90 degrees and he can't go any further. He gets pinching of his hip unless he does this and then he abducts and he actually, it's like he circles around and then he can get back to straight plane flexion. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. There ain't a thing you boy can do about that. Um, that is like a structural issue and likely is gonna need surgery in order to fix that. So just, just be mindful of that, that sometimes if you get someone who is super stiff, there could be a structural thing at play. With that said, Let's talk about what is the order of priority with someone who is essentially A to P compressed in the pelvis because they have restrictions both in ER and IR measures. You have to look first at the infrasternal angle presentation because the secondary compensation, as Matt discussed, is what we need to tackle first more often than not. And the secondary compensation is going to be different depending on your structural archetype. If I'm a narrow infrasternal angle, you want to go after ER-based measures first because that is a secondary compensation. I'll link a debrief in the show notes that outlines that. If you're a wide, you want to go after IR-based measures first because that is the secondary compensation for a wide ISA. Things that would attack either of those. Let's start with the narrow first. So what does this look like to build the squat for a narrow? So a narrow is going to need to do things to improve ER, which would be things that would involve any type of posterior expansion first. That's your first starting point. So things like drunken turtle, squat progressions, things that are going to drive counter-nutation of the sacrum, high depth, activities where you're driving tucking, all of that can be quite effective. Also too, anything that's gonna get posterior thorax expansion is gonna be effective as well. So low reaches, inversions, stuff like that, great for a narrow ISA. Because a squat is not just the sacrum counter nutating, it is the entire spine going into an inhaled orientation, AKA your entire back needs to be eccentric as all hell for you to be vertical. For a wide, you want to go after anterior expansion first if they have this limitation. But Zach, you just said to be able to squat, you need posterior expansion first and foremost in order to make that happen. What the hell are you talking about now? You do. However, when I go through hip flexion, from about, depending on who you are, 45 to 60 degrees of hip flexion at the starting point to 90 to 100, there's more of an internal rotation bias happening at the femurs. And that's going to mean that the pelvis will be nutating to some degree. Not nutation, that doesn't mean that they're going into your pelvic tilt is all hell. It just means that I started in a counter nutated position and then I'm moving towards nutation at that point. And then if you can squat ATG, you're going to recount and mutate at the bottom. 
Therefore, you're gonna need some semblance of internal rotation to squat. One, two, restoring internal rotation and anterior expansion is going to allow you to have a gradient to move the viscera, the synovial fluid, and airflow within the body to allow you to get posterior expansion. Because there is an A to P compression going on for this particular individual with a slight bias and more expansion posteriorly in this case. And the reason why that is, is because a secondary compensation uses more superficial musculature than a primary compensation. You have to be able to shift stuff forward first. So you have a gradient, meaning you have a place of high concentration of stuff to low concentration of stuff that you can then remove in order to attain depth. So by expanding anteriorly, you push all of the stuff air, viscera, synovial fluid forward, and you expand as far as you can. So then you have more stuff that you can push posteriorly to allow that person to squat effectively. Again, check out that debrief that I'll link to dive a bit more detail into that. Things to drive anterior expansion would be mid-range depth squats, hip extension activities, anything that drives the pump handle, Things of that nature are really good at getting anterior expansion and restoring internal rotation. Many times I've found for this population in particular, you may actually have to do some manual stretching to get hip internal rotation. I have my bag of tricks for that, but if you're a manual therapist, I'm sure you have some good stuff to get hip internal rotation. It doesn't think, I don't think it matters that much. Just pick something that works. Once you have those things in place, then you can start working on squat progressions to try and attain depth. Truisms that I think are effective for both narrow and wide is doing things that would involve A to P expansion simultaneously of the pelvis. There's two good ways you can do that. One would be the short lever side plank actually. Interestingly enough, if you are doing a short lever side plank the way I like it, which is rotating up and forward. What's going to happen is when you're up in this position, gravity is going to be pushing the viscera and the pelvis, the goods, downward, meaning it's going to create A to P expansion in the bottom part of the pelvis. Guess what, folks? It's actually a good way to get A to P expansion to some degree in the thorax as well because gravity is going to push air further down. So that's a really nice way to get some A to P expansion in the, the pelvis. Any type of sideline move could be money for that. The other thing you could do, once you've done all the other stuff, let me, I cannot stress that enough, is to work on hip shifting. I like high depth hip shifting. I like just a sideline hip shift, anything like that. Because when you do a hip shift, Assuming you have the stack, and that's why I say you got to do that stuff first. But when you do hip shifting, you're creating some degree of sacral rotation. When I have sacral rotation, I have to have expansion on one part of the pelvis and compression on the opposite side and then vice versa. So when I rotate the sacrum to the left, I have to have posterior expansion of the pelvis on the left side and anterior expansion on the right side. It's the same thing for the thorax. So if you're trying to really attain good squat depth, A to P expansion and rotation of the pelvis are very useful for making that happen. Last but not least, I think this is good for both of these populations, is make sure when you are squatting, you are using a ramp. There's a ramp that I like uh, it's made by my guy, Levi Kirkpatrick. He's, it's awesome. I try to push everyone to him. I don't get any money for it either, just a heads up, folks. Like, I just, it's a really good ramp, and Levi's a friend. So uh, take that for what it's worth. But his ramps are stellar, um, especially if you do the higher incline one. I, almost everyone at Elevate where I work, um, they have, are, are squatting on that ramp. And it's a great way to minimize any potential ankle restrictions. And also, too, if you look at the research on heel elevation with a, 
with a, a squat, it allows for better pelvic verticality, which I think is essential. And if you can get a vertical pelvis, that's going to allow you to go through both the ER and IR phases of hip flexion, which is needed for a squat. And if you do that, chances are you're going to be able to get improvements in hip range of motion with these people. And your supreme clientele are going to be squatting super duper on point.